All right, now it's time for the Spark Tank competition, the Department of the Air Force's flagship innovation program. Spark Tank unleashes the innovative capacity of airmen and guardians and gives them a ch stage to share their problem-solving skills with the world. Although only five ideas will be pitched here today, they're the best of hundreds submitted over the course of the past year. Please welcome Bru Gaucher and Kinsley Trigger Jordan. Thank you, everybody. Hello, Zoom. We're thrilled to be with you today for Spark Tank 2021. Absolutely, Brew. Spark Tank is one of those events I truly, really look forward to every year since the Air Force held the very first one in 2018. And today, once again, we celebrate risk takers and idea makers from across the department, airmen and guardians, entrepreneurs who refuse to accept the status quo and who have created solutions that make it easier for us to bring our very best to the fight. You know, Trigger and I have got a peek at the projects our finalists are bringing to the stage, as well as the, of the others that competed this year. As mentioned previously, over 300 in total. And isn't it incredible, this momentum and movement of innovation that continues to grow? I mean, we really are amazed in seeing that we're starting to see airmen and guardians engaging with each other throughout the year to develop new ideas and test new ways of doing business and still finding time to provide feedback to other entrepreneurs. You're right, Trigger. The numbers this year were impressive. We saw that over 19,000 airmen and guardians viewed those 300 plus ideas on the Airmen and Innovation or Airmen Powered by Innovation platform, provided almost a thousand feedback comments on the ideas, and wow. most importantly, cast over 14,000 votes for their favorite idea to give it the best chance of competing for the stage today. That really is phenomenal participation. And th through our downslide process, we have five unique ideas to change the status quo of today's Air Force and Space Force. See, our finalists will present their ideas to our celebrity spark judges with the hope of receiving some investment money, bureaucracy busting support, and <laughs> of course, the priceless and highly coveted 3D printed Spark Tank trophy. And now it's time for Spark Tank 2021. Let's meet our celebrity judges who have the task of picking a winner from our five finalists. Judges, please be ready to turn on your video so we can see you and give us your best smile and a wave when you're up on screen, on stream. Our first judge and billionaire investor is a cavalier from the University of Virginia. His sharp wit and love of sports illuminate every conversation. As the Air Force's master of coin, he held the keys to the kingdom, but perhaps more importantly for many of us, he made sure we got paid on time. And though he may have started his career in the Navy, he's proud to be both an airman and a guardian now. Ladies and gentlemen, the acting secretary of the Air Force, the Honorable John Roth. All right. All right. Our next celebrity judge is corporate vice president of Microsoft Xbox Game Studios. He started out as a boilermaker from Purdue University, where, amongst other things, he studied acoustics and audio waveform propagation, and then began a career in gaming at Midway Games, where he worked his way all the way up to CEO. In his current position with Microsoft, he leads the organization responsible for developing our favorite Microsoft games for console, PC, and mobile platforms. Xbox Game Studio produces popular franchises such as Minecraft, Halo, Gears of War, Forza, Age of Empires, and so much more. Please welcome Mr. Matt Booty. Hey. Our next judge needs no introduction, but this Dr. Pepper drinking Spider-Man superfan hails from the Lone Star State and will put his smoked brisket up against any top chefs. He was listed in Times Magazine as one of the top 100 most influential people in 2020, and he's commanded at every level. But you know him best as your 22nd Air Force Chief of Staff, ladies and gentlemen, General C.Q. Brown, Jr. Welcome. Our next judge started out at, in Chapel Hill at the University of North Carolina, then ventured into the finance with the Bank of America Merrill Lynch. She's launched her own startup, Runway Technologies, and has vast experience in a number of sectors, including fintech, education, health, food and agriculture, and energy. She excelled in Harvard University's MBA program and now serves as the general partner at Backstage Capital, where she catalyzed the conversation around investing in underrepresented founders. Let's meet Miss Brittany Davis. Hi.
welcome. And this next judge does not have a dandruff problem. On 20 December 2019, he was the first and the only member of the Space Force. A proud graduate of the Harvard of the South, also known as Clemson University, this Tigers family can claim 155 years of uninterrupted military service dating back to when his great-great-grandfather graduated West Point in 1865. Now he leads the nation's newest service, building a team of guardians to protect and defend space for the next 100 years. The first chief of space operations, General J. Raymond. Let's meet our next guest. Standing at five foot three, but six feet in personality, Deco founder and CEO, Megan Metzger, a former NCAA division one gymnast and electrical engineer and marketing double major. Megan cannot get enough of working with the US government on emerging technology. Frankly, Megan is kind of a glutton for government punishment if you think about it. With Decode being her third startup in this space where she leads an incredible team focused on driving commercial innovation into the federal market. Welcome, Megan. Our next judge is an unapologetic Kansas City Chiefs fan who hails from the great state of Hawaii. She is the undisputed Miss Pac-Man champion and a Michelin star level lumpia chef. Even though her father and husband are both proud army vets, she made the right choice and joined our great Air Force. Please welcome the 19th Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Joanne Bass. And our final judge hails from Wisconsin, which is also a huge fan of the Green Bay Packers. Go Pack Go! And enjoys bass fishing in the mountains. He also served 30 years in the Air Force, serving in a myriad of leadership roles as a cryptologic linguist and career aviator before being selected for his current job. Please welcome the first Chief Master Sergeant of the Space Force, Roger A. Toberman. Welcome to all of you, and thank you to all of our amazing judges. We look forward to hearing your questions for our finalists and then selecting the winner of Spark Tank 2021. If I could ask you now to please turn off your cameras and microphones. All right, so it's time to start this year's competition. Though it is a competition, it's important to remember the main goal of this is to help our entrepreneurs see their ideas come to life. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge to the Pentagon staff. <laughs> Exactly right. You know, we're working to integrate the most deserving ideas into the way we deliver air power and space power. Last year, Master Sergeant Gabriel Valenzuela from the Mercury team displayed how his innovative weapons loading checklist shaves off valuable time while generating aircraft to be air combat ready faster than ever. And co-winners, Captain David Tesla Coyle, First Lieutenant Adam Treese, and their Arizona State University teammate, Mr. Wiley Standage Byer, from the low cost threat emitter team presented a unique mobile system that replicates radio emitters on our ranges and will inject better realism into our flying training. Brew, let's take a look and see where those projects are now. My perspective on my journey to Spark Tank was exhilarating as it was extremely challenging and competitive. And I surely didn't expect to be a Spark Tank finalist, much less even a winner. Um, it was really inspiring to see that, you know, Val's idea from the flight line that he was working as a night project because he'd be doing weapons load out all day still as a member of the weapons load crew knowing full well how beneficial it would be to airmen on the flight line to have that capability in hand while they're trying to do weapons loadout. As soon as I heard that idea, I wanted us to be involved. I think the biggest impact we're seeing thus far is just the, the way we're changing the conversation. With our idea in particular, it's, it's a completely different way to approach training, but we're showing with our one little prototype what's possible and that we can achieve some effective training without spending exorbitant amounts of money. The impact of, of an idea like this and showing that it, that, that it can work has generated an excitement around the Air Force, recognizing that something was built basically in a garage. All the way from the very beginning, we, we were supported by a command team who was excited about what we were doing. They had squadron innovation funds that were available, which allowed us to experiment with our idea at a very low risk. 
And then once we, we actually made it into Spark Tank, we had support from organizations like AFWorks who were able to help us through the funding process, through the contracting process, and, and were able to help shepherd this along. Look, it takes a tremendous team to take an idea from the beginning and go all the way to the end and have it be successful, especially something that is entirely new that no one has ever really dealt with before. We wouldn't be where we are without support of many different people. And uh, to that, I would say thank you. Spark Tank as a whole, I love the concept of it. I think it's beneficial Air Force wide. Hearing the voices of airmen and seeing their innovative ideas, try and find a different time in our Air Force history for which an airman on the flight line would have a voice that would be heard, you know, through an innovation idea directly up to the chief and sec app. Yeah, if you have an idea, get out there, take a risk, do it, build a prototype, get, get your idea in front of people. My advice to you airmen is to never hesitate to voice your ideas and don't take no for an answer. So stay positive, stay persistent. It's going to be challenging, but it's an exciting journey to see your idea make a change in the Air Force. Continue to iterate on that idea. Continue to let other people be contributors to that idea. Val did just that. Sometimes you got to take a chance, and I think a lot of people did take a chance with us, and, and now we're starting to see some good results, but thank you for that. Thank you for giving us the opportunity. So please, tell somebody about your idea, and don't stop. That's super inspiring, Trigger. It, it absolutely is. You know, today each team will be giving their pitch in a form of a video. Following the, these pitch videos, each team will have five minutes of live discussion with the judges. After all pr presentations are complete, the judges will deliver it in breakout sessions until the very end where they tell us who has won and who gets their spark. And remember, like always, you, our audience, get to weigh in too. Your voice will be heard for your favorite idea via our live poll. The poll is open now at the URL that they're going to show on your screen here in just a second. Good luck, everyone. Now let's meet the Spark Tank 21, 2021 finalists. Let's do it. The first into the Spark Tank is the innovative approach to C-130 wheel repair, embracing the idea of working smarter and not harder. The C-130 wheel repair team threw out the whole oven for a single tool to heat the wheels. Please welcome Justin. Over to you. Good morning, judges. I'm Mass Sergeant Justin Bauer. I'm a crew chief and production superintendent from Davis Monthan Air Force Base, Arizona currently deployed to the AFSENT area of operations. Thank you so much for being here this morning and thank you to the AFWorks team, my leadership, and my incredible wife, Lauren, for their support thus far. Roll the video. Over the next few minutes, I'd like to share my project with you, which aids in producing agile, combat-ready aircraft through a novel approach to wheel repair. But first, I'd like to tell you how we began. As a young airman, I was always deeply disappointed when I lacked equipment to perform a repair to an aircraft component, especially when trained and authorized to do so. Now, 14 years later as a senior NCO leading my own talented airman, I hear them expressing the same frustration, and I can see how a poorly equipped maintainer can affect the enterprise on a larger scale. Over the past several years, the C-130 community has been struggling to maintain an adequate supply of serviceable aircraft wheels. When wheels require inspection, they are required to maintain a temperature of over 200 degrees, and the available ovens demand substantial facility upgrades and cost over $250,000 per unit. This lack of equipment has forced our capable airmen to utilize outside agencies to complete inspections and repairs. This process costs nearly $12,000 per wheel, and because the process is meant to be completed in the field, we've accumulated a backlog of over 500 assets, causing a several month delay in repairs and severely damaging our ability to maintain a combat ready fleet. Imagine, if you will, the world's greatest Air Force borrowing wheels from aircraft and consolidating them to produce combat sorties. Chief, this is exactly the choice that your commanders and maintainers have been forced to make, but we now have a solution. I have designed an inexpensive and simple to use heating element that requires no special training or facility upgrades. This handheld device allows the wheel to be heated from the inside out, enabling wheel repairs at the field level, and our airmen are incredibly excited to further contribute to their mission. The prototype of my element has been thoroughly tested and proven tremendously successful. 
While costing just $400, our airmen have utilized its capabilities to perform all wheel repairs at home stations, successfully returning these vital assets to the field in just 96 hours. We've even reduced the current backlog by 100 wheels and secured process approval from Air Force engineer and the wheel's original manufacturer. The success of my element have provided Davis Moth in a full stock of C-130 wheels for the first time in a decade. This increase of field level repair capabilities offers a projected savings of $46 million within five years of implementation and will provide a fleet sustaining source of wheels immediately. As a senior NCO, I am so proud of our team who have leveraged my design to directly impact the readiness of the warfighter. I envision this same pride and empowerment made available to maintainers across the force, and we can do just that. My heating element is ready to be fielded to every C-130 unit in the world today. Judges helped me champion this idea by connecting me with the leaders of Headquarters A4, National Guard, and Reserve Commands to allow for a total force solution. With your support, I continue to work to scale a variant of the element for other airframes suffering from similar problems, and C-130 units can utilize local purchasing abilities to outfit their airmen with my current version immediately. With your support, we can begin eliminating this logistical challenge, allowing our airmen to again produce the world's most agile and combat-ready aircraft fleet, eliminate our under-equipped maintainers, and most importantly, show the force that any airman's local solution can solve an enterprise problem. Thank you. Okay, outstanding. Judges and Justin, please turn on your camera and mics. We'll now have five minutes of Q&A. Chief Brown, I understand you're ready with a question. Yeah, well, well done, uh, Master and Bauer. Appreciate that, and uh, hope the year deployment is going well. The question I have for you is, is as you went through this process, what uh, what was probably your biggest uh, hurdle or roadblock you had to get past in order to get to where you are today? Uh, yes, sir. Great question. Uh, so the biggest challenge we faced was balancing our, our our heating requirements and our power demand. It's really easy to heat up a chunk of metal as long as you're willing to use an unlimited amount of electricity. Uh, but to empower our, and equip our airmen as quickly as possible, we really wanted to keep it under 115 volts so that facilities across the globe could, could power the device. And uh, through careful consideration of, of where to apply the heat, we were able to do just that. Thanks. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, did you have a follow-on question? Okay, we'll open it up to any of the judges. Uh, let me ask a question. This is uh, Secretary Roth. Uh, I think you may have answered a question, but let me just double check. So a lot of our partner nations fly to C-130 as well. And so would this innovation work with all the variants and particularly would it account for perhaps considerations for different voltage and other power adaptions uh, on a multinational kinds of things? And could we just, you know, could we shop it around with a multinational workshop of one sort or the other? Over? Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Uh, that's a great question. And that's one of the most exciting uh, things about this device is that through small changes in its dimensions and heating uh, capabilities, we can easily flex this device to, to multiple airframes, multiple multiple service, services and multiple nationalities. So uh, through, through small changes in design, we can adapt the current device to, to solve a lot of issues across the aircraft community. Hey, Sergeant Bauer, I have a question. Uh, first of all, great job and love the idea. My question to you is if we continue to heat up just, I think, one part of the wheel, are we concerned that over time that that'll cause damage um, to perhaps just that one part versus heating up the entire wheel? Uh, great question, ma'am. So our, our maintainers uh, leverage uh, uh, thermal expansion to, to do the repairs through, through heating the wheel. And, and to get to your question, we've worked with multiple thermodynamics engineers as, rel as well as the original equipment manufacturer to ensure the integrity of the ma material wouldn't be sacrificed by the way we're doing it. And uh, we've been confirmed by, by multiple sources that, that the thermal expansion of the wheel remains exactly the same regardless of where you place the heat. So uh, we are safe to, to protect our assets in that manner. Thank you for the question. Good deal, thank you. Hey, this is Megan here. Um, so one thing I love about this is the scalability of it. So taking it, if you can save $46 million on one fleet, imagine the cost savings. But so I heard the cost savings for the construction of it. I'm curious what it would take to get folks trained on how to build it and trained on how to use it. Uh, yes, ma'am. So our current technical data actually already authorizes our maintainers to use a tool such as this. So they 
they are already trained to do so. Um, it would just be a five minute on the job training to familiarize themselves with the tool. And uh, outside civilian manufacturers are able to produce this for such a small cost that I think bases leveraging local purchasing abilities to outfit their airmen is probably the best way to go. And as far as the training, training concerns, there really aren't any, our, our airmen are ready to go. We just need to equip them to do so. Yeah. Great. Uh, hi, one question for me. Hi, this is Brittany. Um, can you talk about the heating element and are you innovating on the actual heating element or is that something that you can source from external suppliers? I think you were touching on that just, just a moment ago, but if you could explain. Uh, that would great, great questions. So the, the heating element started out as a small, small doodle on a napkin, if you will. Uh, typically what happens is the, is the wheel is required to be placed in a very large oven. It consumes a tremendous amount of electricity and most facilities across the force just aren't equipped to plug it in, as simple as that sounds. Uh, additionally, it requires our maintainers to move a 200 pound chunk of aluminum in and out of an oven while it's 250 degrees. So it's not ergonomically friendly, it's not safe. Uh, and so through the design of this heating element, we allow our airmen to carry a small three to five pound device to the wheel uh, and place it inside and heat it in that manner. So uh, to answer your question, no, the, the heating element is a fresh design. It's just a new take on a way to apply heat to metal. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good morning, this is Matt. Real quickly, uh, why do you think no one thought of this yet to date? Uh, I, 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 it seems super impressive and the numbers seem to speak for themselves. So well, why do you think that neither the people that make the ovens or, or the wheel assembly haven't thought of this yet? Uh, that's a that's a that's a great question. One that I had not uh, practiced. Um, I, I think that uh, I think that we get complacent. We get in the status quo sometimes. Uh, all of our airmen are very busy. They all want to contribute to the mission, and they work very hard to do so. I think that sometimes uh, we just kind of get in the groove of things of making things happen under all circumstances. And so uh, I think that a lot of us were just standing in the right place at the right time to say, "Hey, we need to do something different." On that note, what are your biggest roadblocks? You know, what, who's going to be upset about this or what roadblocks do you think you'll run into when trying to go to scale? Uh, no, uh, great question. So uh, nobody should be upset. Uh, the technical data, like I said before, uh, already authorizes and encourages us to do this in the field. So our inability to do so has kind of jammed up the logistics lines across the force. So 30 seconds. There's probably going to be more folks that are happy that, that we're, uh, uh, doing this roadblocks ahead. Uh, I would say the vast nature of the Air Force, we have so many different airframes and that's where I'm asking for your support to leverage this idea and give me contacts with the, the leaders and doers within the A4 community uh, to really get out there and find where these logistic challenges lie and where this heating element can help us solve them. Judges and Justin, thank you so incredibly much. That concludes our five minute Q&A and, and we are so excited to continue moving on because it's ideas like this that make our Air Force so great of people looking at problems and coming up with solutions. Brew? Exactly right. Judges and Justin, please turn off your cameras and mics. Next up, we have Major Kevin, Cosmo Hawkins and repeat finalist, Lieutenant Adam Trees from the Next Generation Debrief Team bringing augmented reality to the Air Force flight training programs. Good morning. I'm Major Kevin Hawkins. I'm Lieutenant Adam Treese. We're coming to you from the 56th Fighter Wing at Luke Air Force Base, and we're really excited to share our video with you. Please go ahead and play it. Today's air and space mission is a complex, high-speed, high-tech endeavor. Look at how missions are planned or how we review them to find lessons learned. You'll see we use whiteboards, laminated maps, flat computer displays. Low tech, low efficiency processes that worked yesterday, but aren't gonna give us an edge tomorrow. I'm Major Kevin Hawkins. And I'm Lieutenant Adam Treese. We're intelligence officers at Luke Air Force Base. In our work, we've experienced this pain firsthand. After watching another plan fall apart, another debrief struggle to capture what actually happened, we looked at each other and said, they plan on a map, but they need to visualize a fight above the map. They debrief on a screen, but need to understand a fight that happens all around them. We started looking for a solution. Our vision began with mission planning, but we decided starting with the debrief was the best first step. In partnership with Arizona State University, we've developed NextGen Debrief, using cutting edge augmented reality to change the way we look at the fight. 
Our approach is meant to keep what's good about current processes. Simplicity, portability, ease of use. On top of this, it helps users rapidly understand mission data and events in three dimensions, interact with that picture using their hands while retaining the ability to communicate face-to-face. -face. This lowers the barrier to entry and improves the likelihood crews will choose to incorporate this system in their debriefs. This approach not only opens up how we debrief, but when and where debriefs can be conducted. Combined with a secure cloud infrastructure and data protocols, we see NextGen Debrief enabling a distributed debrief capability, unlocking our potential to fight as a truly agile force. We're inspired by the progress we've made so far and excited about the possibilities in front of us. But before asking for a force-wide investment, we want to put this to the test. We see our biggest risks for failure, users being unable or unwilling to adopt, and the difficulty integrating into classified environments. We're asking for your support to help us refine and deploy the first version of our system within seven months at three sites. With that initial feeling, we'll work with Air University to study user experience and mission effectiveness. At the 12-month mark, we'll bring you our recommendations for wider deployment based on our results. Meanwhile, we'll be working the processes to ensure we can securely bring these tools to the full spectrum of war fighting capability. We're asking you to let us lean in and fail fast or prove value with an initial investment of $900,000. 400000 of that will be dedicated to getting headsets, licenses, computing infrastructure and support we need, and the remaining 500000 will be for continued development and refinement of our software platform. Thank you. Judges, Cosmo, Adam, please turn on your, your cameras and microphones for our five minutes of Q&A. Excellent. Chief Raymond. I think you had a question to start off for this team. Can you hear me? Loud and clear, sir. Hey, great, thanks. Hey, appreciate the presentation. Uh, I'm really intrigued by it, excited by what you presented and, and really uh, eager to explore the relevance, not just for the air domain, but for the space domain. Um, and, and, and also very uh, intrigued about the uh, future dis, uh, distribution, distributed uh, work. Um, do, do you have the ability to take not just uh, CAN training simulation data, uh, but also live, uh, live fly performance data from both air and space domains? So General, thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, right now, we're still in the conceptual phase. Uh, you know, we, we have a proof of concept built, but uh, that is certainly the, that the capability that we're working to bring to the field would be to be able to, uh, to get it working with live data, uh, which, which could enable kind of mission monitoring as well as the, the debrief process. But that, that's something we're working towards. We're partnering with the AFL CMC's live mission operations capability as well that for our training ranges, uh, that is going to help us uh, scale our architecture as well as give us access to a lot of the data on the training side. But there's plenty more to do uh, when we expand beyond ranges into an operational environment. Yeah, I see great value beyond just training. I mean, one of the challenges we have, you know, in, when I'm picking up a phone trying to, you know, when I was a combatant commander trying to talk to the chairman and describe something over voice of what's going on in the space domain, it's really hard. And to be able to have that ability to do that uh, distributed and to give a picture would be very, very valuable. Thanks a lot. Mr. Booty, did you have a follow-up question on that? Yeah, hi, good morning. Uh, first, uh, I would be uh, really interested perhaps to follow up and connect you with the Microsoft Flight Simulator team, which of course uh, we do quite a lot of real-time data integration from commercial flights, uh, and that could certainly be expanded. So uh, perhaps a follow-up there. My question is, in your initial use of this, have you found that uh, with pilots trying to navigate the 3D space and sort of understand the augmented and virtual reality, does that take away from the debrief itself? In other words, does that actually become a distraction compared to thinking about what happened uh, during the mission? Or have you found that, that uh, they become comfortable with it and it sort of gets out of the way? Good morning, sir. Thank you for that question. Yeah, I think that hits on one of the key points here of what we think that why AR is so valuable. Uh, we see that AR really can nail down that user experience that we're looking for in the sense that it enhances our current processes. 
So we realize that if this is going to be useful, pilots have to want to use it. It has to be intuitive. And we think that with AR, enhancing the current processes and not forcing them to learn a new process, it, it will be valuable in that regard. You know, the way we currently do debrief, there's a lot of value in that face-to-face -face interaction. Uh, AR allows you to maintain that. And not only will we be able to maintain that in your current debriefing room, but now you can do that with people in a distributed location. I think Great, I'm gonna, if I don't, if you don't mind me jumping in, um, cause you talked about building it so that people will want to use it and following off of Mr. Booty's question in the seven month MVP build period, how do you plan on keeping a human centered approach and making sure that the pilots and folks that have to use this will be involved? Yeah, th thank you for that question. Um, so, you know, the, the, our, the way we want to bring this forward is we want to get it out there fast uh, and get it. So why we chose seven months and, and really we want to get it in people's hands before seven months. Uh, and, and then it's going to be a continuous feedback process. But, but frankly, we've still got a lot to explore in that, that space. And that's why uh, we want to get some, some objective study done there and build, build the data. But that, that process also allows us to refine the user experience. And we, we see that being a continuous dialogue with the users uh, at the units that we're deploying this to first. 30 second warning judges. Uh, I had one more question. And once you get it up and running, one of the biggest costs I see is going to be on maintaining it, keeping the algorithms fresh, keeping the data fresh. What's your plan for long-term sustainment of it? Well, uh, thank you, ma'am. Yeah, th that is a good question. Uh, and. For, for where we are focused right now is we, we want to prove the value of the concept and, and that long-term sustainment piece is kind of what we are going to ask leadership to address when we bring you the results in a year. Uh, we that, that is a big question and, and it really depends on the scope that we end up wanting to take this to force wide. Great. Yeah, just yeah. real quickly, they, I'd love to follow up with you all on some of those things. You know, with uh, we have quite a lot of experience there with flight simulators, so we'd be happy to uh, make ourselves available. Thanks for the presentation. Thank, thank you. Yeah. I love it. The other one reminded me of my third grader diagramming his uh, some of his projects. So I think this is a huge progress. Thank you. Thanks. Outstanding. Any save rounds or alibis? I didn't have any questions from the field on this one, so we have about twenty more seconds. Let me ask you a quick question. Uh, great, great job on this one. Just your data source. Uh, you know, is it the standard data that you would bring back out of a uh, uh, out, of, out of the uh, aircraft, or is there something special you have to do to get the data to actually recreate? Yes, sir. Thank you for that. Uh, so, with the live mission operation capability, uh, their architecture is already going to provide a great deal of that data. And you're, you're talking about your typical ACMI data, the data coming off the threat emitters on the range. That, that's where we're going to focus with this initial effort. And through their, their architecture and platform, I think a lot of that's already going to be available. Okay, thanks. Thank you, judges. Cosmo and Adam, another great idea. It absolutely is. And judges, Kevin, Adam, please now turn off your cameras and microphone because next up in the Spark Tank is improving the commander support staff workflow with Office 365. Over to you, Anthony. Hi, my name is Anthony Apodaca, and I'm coming to you from the Dean of Faculty at your United States Air Force Academy. And I wouldn't be here today without the great support of our academic team, like the CIO, the CTO, and our very own CSS personnel. We also have tremendous support behind us from the Dean, our brand studio team, and our flight line crew, and our master, master process officer. So MCs, please play that video. The problem is the lack of communication with our customers. With lack of communication, we have day-to-day -day interaction with our customers via email, phone calls, whatever the case is. Um, we're not able to get to all of those communications in a timely manner. So before we used to be able to respond to our customers in 24 hours, now we're looking at a four day, 96 hour turnaround, which is just crazy. We can't do that. We need to be able to assist our customers quick, fast, and in a hurry to make sure that their processes are good to go. Last year in the 2020 Spark Tank closing comments, the Vice Chief of Staff said that we we're trying to give the airmen back their time. If we look at the numbers, 
4,700 CSSs Air Force wide. By the end of 2022, we're gonna be at 6,200 CSSs. On average, there's about three airmen per CSS. This app is gonna be a game changer. When you add up the time we take replying to emails on repetitive information, we're taking time away from making the updates for our airmen and taking care of our airmen. With this app, we can save the, the Air Force over $27 million. What we do is we vet the request before it even gets to the CSS. So um, in our application, say I wanted to you know, update my training record uh, or a fitness record. What I would do is open up the app, see fitness as an option, click on the fitness option. There should be an option there to update my fitness record. And if there's instructions on how to do that, those will happen before they even submit a request. Uh, I, I was uh, able to access this application while I was at home and working remotely through virtual means and that allowed me to continue to progress through my in-processing and training requirements. When I'm not at work, the app is still working, which is taking care of the airmen, and that's what we need. Our ask is $300,000 for one year. 80,000 of that will pay for additional capability within our licensing structure that will allow us to scale up our application development and also be positioned with our data storage. The 220,000 will pay for one full-time equivalent to help us get to the next level with our applications development and also help us with that data management. The, the app guided me through the whole process on how to submit the, the document. Second, they also kept me informed of everything that was going on with the document and how it was going up the chain. And lastly, he gave me a, a final status and I can always go back and reach out to the, to the final document. And you can use this app anywhere. Anytime. With any device. Welcome to the CSS workflow of the future. Outstanding. Now let's start our Q&A. Mr. Secretary, I understand you may have had a question to open up for the Air Force Academy team. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, you know, obviously as a career bureaucrat, I'm always interested in improving workflows through the bureaucracy, believe it or not. Anyway, you seem focused on the CSS bureaucracy and the CSS workflow. Uh, since we have a lot of this, as I just alluded to, across the entire bureaucracy, a lot of jobs and functions, what do you think the potential is for scaling this in a way that it can be used in other areas and other career fields across the entire department? Uh, of course, and a great question. And the, and the answer to that is already clear. We're already running into that situation right now where we have, uh, we're already trying to improve workflows across many different types of workflows, processes, including um, um, onboarding of personnel, um, evaluations or stratification processes, and even budget processes as well. So we're taking a look at all of it. And uh, part of the ask is hoping to scale up this work here at USAFA so we can kind of be the, at the bleeding edge of this uh, innovation here. Good, thank you. All right, judges. I can jump in. I want to say first, I loved that you actually used the word customer in the video because um, that is exactly what you all are doing. And I think that's so critical to keep that mindset. Um, one kind of tactical question, do you have any security concerns like PII and things like that? Or are those not as critical because it's just extending your existing platform? So there's kind of two parts to that uh, answer there. The first part I'll say in our current environment here at the Air Force Academy, we are authorized uh, for PII and uh, for official use only work within our cloud environment. So the power platform falls under that. Uh, for the Air Force, great news. Um, we've learned from Microsoft that as of April, the same capabilities you saw in the video and what we're creating here at the Air Force Academy will be widely available to um, everyone who has an Office 365 account in the Air Force. Um, so that's one way um, we'll start to see wide adoption, I think. Hi, good morning. Um, it's very interesting. Could you uh, explain perhaps a little bit how much of this project requires what I would call creating new code or new systems or to what extent are you just connecting sort of off the shelf modules? And, and I ask that just to get to how easily you think it could be expanded, uh, assuming it's successful and you wanna uh, start to expand its use. 
Absolutely. Well, the, the, the thing that we're replacing in a lot of cases in these processes or workflows is Excel workbooks. And the great thing is that it only takes the knowledge of Excel to uh, run the Power Platform or to work in the Power Platform. The combination of Power Apps, Power BI, and Power Automate all use a similar type uh, information. And so it didn't take me very long to learn it. And uh, I, you know, our airmen out in the field are already trying to solve these types of problems. So with a tool already in hand, um, I think we'll start to see rapid development for sure. Hey, uh, General Raymond, I got a quick question for you. Um, you said you need the dollars to upgrade the, the Microsoft infrastructure. What do you actually have to do uh, if, if, if what you just said is you're using kind of an Excel, you know, platform? And then how would we look at this to not just do this at the academy? What does the, the Department of the Air Force need to do to build the infrastructure so all bases could be able to do this and expand its use across the across the department. Sure. So I'll answer your second question first. Um, as of April first, there's no, there will be nothing stopping uh, the general Air Force personnel member to start using this platform. Um, you know, what we're asking for here at the Air Force Academy is to be at the forefront in innovation as an academic institution, as uh, the U.S. Air Force Academy. And uh, the, power, the expanded power platform that we're asking for actually provides an environment where we can be at that bleeding edge. And I feel like the, the technology will then bleed out to the rest of the Air Force. There are some technical differences between the two environments, um, and I'd be happy to go through those at a different time for sure. 30 second warning judges. Hey, I've got a, a quick question. First, hey, thanks. Uh, thanks, you guys. I, I love that you want to do this better. Um, the CSS is the storefront for the entire institution and the questions you answer and the problems you solve is what earns that commitment. And so thanks for caring about that. And I, and I think this app is going to be great, right? It's going to get things done quicker. But what about that, that personal thing? What about those nuances? And I need to feel that the institution cares about me. How are you making sure that when a person needs to, to, to answer these questions and a person needs to be there to, to make sure they know we got their back, uh, what's your plan for that? So um, with tremendous work with the, the CSS, and I might lead to them uh, for a response to that, but we I have built in the application a tremendous way for uh, members to communicate not only with their customers, but with the uh, specialists that are working with them in the CSS. So within the app, you don't need to leave the app to, to direct message uh, a CSS member, which is great. Um, you can have direct messaging capabilities. Um, we use, um, you know, Power Automate and a few things combined to get that to work. Um, and then, you know, you can do what you're used to as well. I'm sure CSS is just a phone call away and I'll leave it to any of our CSS members to fill in on that communication piece. Hey, Anthony, uh, I'm gonna jump in real quick. Tech Sergeant Ross here. So Chief, to answer your question, yes, um, the CSS will still be there. We'll still be able to answer the phone calls. We'll still be able to have the members come into the office if need be, but just in case we are out of the office after hours and they need a question, that's where this app comes into play. They should be able to ask us anything that they need. Um, we'll answer those questions via the, the chat like Anthony mentioned here momentarily, um, a minute ago, and we'll still be have, able to have that face-to-face -face interaction if need be. And with that, awesome. I Judges, think we have thank to you so much. Us today. Thanks, we guys. sure do. We do, sure do. Thank you, Anthony and the entire USAFA team. Absolutely great idea. Brew? Judges and Anthony, you can now turn off your cameras and mics again. Next to the Spark Tank, all the way from the UK, we have the inner, in the ear bone conduction communication team. This team set out on the noble cause of saving airmen's hearing and the root of the problem. Chris and Chris, over to you. Hey, thanks everyone. This is Mass Sergeant Pettingill and with me I have Tech Sergeant Anderson. And again, we're coming all the way from the United Kingdom in the legendary Bloody 100th. Go ahead and roll the tape. Every day, Airmen and Guardians strive to get the mission done. For aircraft maintainers, the mission creates loud noises that can damage our hearing, and so we have to protect ourselves. We do this by utilizing the same equipment that we have used since the 80s, foam plugs and over-the-ear hearing protection. However, this causes an issue. In order to be able to complete the mission, we have to be able to communicate, which brings us to the problem, the maintenance dilemma. Do the aircraft maintainers choose to prioritize their hearing 
and slow down the mission, possibly losing critical seconds to make a decision, or do they execute the mission quickly, but at the expense of their hearing? In the ear, bone conduction technology is the solution to this problem. This technology provides the hearing protection required while also allowing the user to hear and communicate with anyone around them. Additionally, we can stop putting our airmen and guardians hearing at risk while in a chemical warfare environment because the hearing protection can easily go under the chemical suits we are required to wear. But wait, there's more. This equipment isn't only for aircraft maintainers. It can be utilized by pilots, security forces, EOD, and many, many more. Over the past year and a half, our team has worked with industry leaders in bone conduction technology to establish a proof of concept. Our efforts have field tested and validated our solution. We have collected a lot of feedback from maintainers and established a cadre of subject matter experts across maintenance and medical career fields. We have made it to Spark Tank, but we have not come alone. Along with us comes thousands of maintainers and millions of veterans who understand the long-term importance of this project. In order to hear them, we're asking for your help. We would like to stand up a program of record. This will help spread future spending needs out over time as the project matures, as well as help smoothly scale this project across the entire Air and Space Force. This is a huge effort with a huge impact and will require planning and strategy in order to be successful. So what happens if we do nothing? Well, sadly, life will continue, but the mission won't get any quieter. The painful choice will be the only choice. Poor communication will continue to muffle the mission. And a lifetime of silence will carry with us long after our career is over. In the end, there's only one question that really needs to be answered. Can, Can you hear us now? Awesome. Judges, Judges and Chris, please turn your cameras and microphones on. You now have five minutes for Q&A. I'll jump in. How, uh, how sustainable are those earpieces? Uh, how long do they last? Uh, what's the durability? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I'm going to hand that over to Tech Sergeant Anderson, who's been working in the field when it, collecting that kind of information. Go ahead. Hey, sir. Uh, so these uh, these headsets have, were actually designed uh, initially for special forces operators. So they are extremely durable. Um, so far, we've been testing them for about a year, and we've only had one or two minor complications with them. But we haven't actually had to change any of them out yet. Hey, guys. So that, that kind of uh, goes into my question. That's what I was wondering. I was like, I you know, I've put these things in my ears on HH60s in Afghanistan. This is just the same exact stuff. You guys are really just asking to get what somebody else has, or, or is there something new or different about this um, specifically? Yes, Chief. Uh, so initially, this device was used for both the special operators and then rotary wing, but it's never been used in the uh, fixed wing uh, domain. And so that takes a it takes a little bit more um, technology in order to do it because they because of the sounds from the engines with how high they are. Um, it creates a lot of different obstacles than what it does with an HH60. Thanks. Hey, so yeah, and the, oh, go ahead. I, I was also going to add that uh, each aircraft has a different frequency, which requires uh, a little bit more attention to to detail to getting those uh, frequencies just right. But that's a great question. Go ahead, Chief. Sorry hey, to cut you off. Hey, it's all good, Sergeant Pendergill Anderson. Hey, great job. And I want to tell you that we can hear you now. And we don't want to continue suffering in silence. Um, and, and to that end, so the standard for years has always been the over-the-ear um, hearing protection. How can we guarantee that something as small as, as, as what you all are presenting is really going to protect the ears of our airmen and guardians? Over. Chief, Chief, that's a great question. I can handle that. Uh, so we've actually worked with a lot of our uh, medical professionals as well to get a lot of feedback of, of what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. So what's actually going in the ear is the same level of foamy protection that you would get from 
uh, a regular earphone. Uh, the only difference is you can actually hear through it now. And the little foam pieces are are consumable, so they you don't have to wear the same one over and over. But uh, yeah, it, it really, this has been more of a, an understanding of transforming how we view hearing protection, especially in the maintenance career field, uh, and bringing both of these silos together, maintenance and, and the medical community, kind of working together to say, hey, this is a good solution. So speaking with my medical friends, they said, hey, we've been to a con hearing protection convention and seeing the same technology that you would see at like a special <laughs> operations convention. Uh, so we, we think we've got something there. So, so Megan here, this one um, actually was a little bit hit a personal note. So bear with me. I'm married to a professional drummer and I actually have the commercial version of these things in my house and he uses them to cut the grass. Um, but so I love it. And I, I would be curious, I didn't see anything on cost. And so I'd be curious the cost of production. And the follow on question to that is, are you starting from scratch with a new production manufacturer or can you leverage commercial manufacturers that are building them for other industries like musicians and things like that to upgrade or retrofit at potentially a lower cost? I'll let Chris handle this one. <laughs> well, that's a great question. Yeah, so the industry already exists. There's several different brands. We, we aren't here actually promoting any one particular brand, though some do more than others. Uh, we did find one that did that did added the hearing protection first and the communication second, but it's very similar to what you would see in the drumming world. So uh, the only difference is we can connect the aircraft and we can also hear uh, ambient noise around us. So it, it's very interesting. If you're a drummer and you're on stage and you hear one of your bandmates talk to you and you can hear them very clearly, um, it, it's quite incredible technology. For our maintainers, uh, having an, uh, an engine running at full blast and then having to communicate with someone. I mean, you've been to a concert, you try to call someone while the speakers are going, you, you're not going to be able to communicate very well. You can hear so, yeah, the, yeah. Yeah, the technology is there. Um, it, it's just some iteration done as far as cost. That's a that's an interesting question that I could love to tell you offline. Okay. The other thing I would take into consideration on your cost, um, not just cost compared to the existing solution, but if there's any data available on how much we're paying out in disability to veterans that have hearing loss, that would be interesting. Oh, absolutely. We have uh, just 271,000 new recipients from just last year on hearing alone. Um, the, 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 the congressional cost is in the billions. So we, we know it's there. The, the 2019 National Defense Authorization Act, Congress asked specifically, what is the Department of Defense doing to address innovative approaches to hearing law? So we know that it's a concern from the civilian side, uh, and we think we have a solution that it mirrors similar uh, solutions across the other services as well. Just real quickly, this is Matt. Uh, I think you touched on this, but have you found difficulty getting the noise canceling software and algorithms to adapt to different engines with different frequencies and things? I know that many of those are tuned to being inside a commercial aircraft or for an automobile or for sort of a music performance. Is that something the manufacturers are working with you on? Or are you able to uh, sort of adjust that on the fly? How has that worked out? Hey, Matt, I'll, uh, I'll handle this one. Uh, so yes, we're, we're working with the manufacturers on it. Um, it is something that is difficult. Um, the, current, the current manufacturer that we're working with um, is working with some AI technology to be able to decipher the sounds of an engine or a, uh, 30 seconds. a power cart. And, a uh, in the human voice, and it's it's amazing whenever you put these on, and, and you can hear the difference with it. Um, but overall, with the it, it's getting better, um, and it's not so much uh, having to change it from aircraft to aircraft. Just the compat the compatibility whenever connected to the aircraft is kind of the one of the bigger obstacles that we have. Understood. Well, as a photographer who spent a lot of time around uh, military aircraft at air shows, uh, I'd be interested when you get it working to get a pair. So good luck with the project. Thank you. Thank you, judges. And also Chris and Chris, great idea. Judges, Thanks, everyone. Uh, judges, Chris, as you can turn off your cameras and microphones, because next up on the Spark Tank is our final team, the Viper Hot Refuel Kit, who have uniquely configured existing petroleum oil and and lubricant components, hot pit ready package, eliminating the, eliminating the need to transport refueling trucks. Jason and Tim, over to you.
Hello from Team Viper. You can go ahead and roll the footage. I'm Master Sergeant Jason Junker. And I'm Master Sergeant Tim Peters. And we're from the 52nd Fighter Wing, 52nd Logistics Readiness Squadron, Fuels Management Flight, Spangalam Air Base, Germany. And we're here representing the Viper Kit. Have you ever seen a NASCAR pit stop? The pit stop gives the driver the ability to pull up to the pit where all of the tools and equipment are available to rapidly get back onto the track. Agile Combat Employment, or ACE, is the Air Force's version of a no-notice pit stop away from home, rapidly getting the aircraft back into the fight. The way that we deploy fuel trucks, the asset that enables pit stops, takes three to 10 days just to get the clearance and costs $80,000 or more to get them to their destination. That's a problem. Did you know we have this problem? When I was deployed on a bomber mission last summer, we had to ship two fuel trucks just to support one 10-minute hot refuel operation. That's when we realized we have to find a better way. And there is a better way, the Viper Kit, a rapidly deployable, hot pit capable refueling platform. It allows us to use available infrastructure anywhere in the world. And it enables pit stops at a fraction of the cost and time needed to do so. This gives leaders the flexibility to project air power in a more agile manner. Our innovation provides the same capability that we already have for every airframe. It adheres to environmental standards, it has built-in controls to mitigate safety issues, and unlike the current method, it utilizes partner nation infrastructure. How does it do this? Currently, it takes four and a half hours to certify one fuel truck for shipment. The Viper Kit, however, can be mobile in 10 minutes. And it's six times smaller, 14 times lighter, 85% less expensive, requires 50% less manpower to operate, and requires no new training. More importantly, it has a permanent effect. It prevents us from losing money and time that can go back to the airmen during every international mission. The Viper Kit is already built. It works. We've deployed it and measured no performance loss. So we're asking our Air Force to adopt this into its centrally managed equipment program to equip the entire force. To do this, we need $2 million. This will fund 50 units sent to four major commands and our execution plan has this delivered within nine months. Our Air Force has been able to survive using the old way, but are you willing to trade $2 million to help our airmen accelerate across the finish line? Outstanding. Judges and Justin, please turn on your cameras. Uh, excuse me, Judges Timothy and Jason, turn on your cameras. You'll now have five minutes of Q&A. Chief Brown, I believe quick turning Viper ground times is near and dear to your heart. Did you have a question for this team? Uh, and agile comp uh, combat employment as well. So uh, guys, a uh, great presentation. Hey, the question, the question I have for you is uh, how do you manufacture this? Was, was this from existing uh, uh, supply things that we already have in the Air Force and you're able to put, put the pieces and parts together or did you build something completely new to do this? Uh, General, yes, we, we use things that are already in the uh, the POL arsenal. So we just kind of reconfigured the Legos to what you see before you from things that we are already trained on, already qualified, and already certified in our career field. And then if you were going to use this at a uh, deployed location, you mentioned in your video that you could use it at a, in a various host nation. What does the host nation have to have to make sure this is going to work so you don't get there and forget you needed a fuel truck? They just need to have the NATO-specific uh, equipment that they already have. So we could deploy this not only to a host nation, but even to a civilian airport. So as long as it's a pre-filtered fuel source, then we're good to go and we can hot refuel. Okay, thanks. Other judges? Uh, let me jump in real quick. This is John Roth. Um, <clears throat> you know, wearing my old comptroller hat, I'm always interested in saving money. So you, you've intrigued me here. You mentioned the portability and all, but go another layer down a little bit in terms of how safe is it actually to fly on board an aircraft? And, uh, you know, is it unsafe inside the aircraft? How do you deal with that and make sure that you can deal with the safety issues of flight? Yes, sir. So we, uh, we can completely drain the kit of fuel in 10 minutes or less, which would then render it as a completely non-hazardous cargo asset, making it fully airworthy and completely uh, uh, unnecessary to certify it as any kind of dangerous cargo. Okay. 
Um, I'll jump in. I obviously I'm not in the Air Force, but I I did this that you can't do this today. If I'm being very honest, maybe I've watched too many movies. But um, you mentioned no cost of training, which is fantastic. But talk to me more about the cost of getting people trained up on how to actually manufacture it, or how will you manufacture it at scale? Yes, ma'am. I'm glad that you asked that. Um, we've also we've talked with some commercial vendors already. And uh, we've already lined up uh, people that can manufacture the parts. And as uh, Tim has said before, all of the parts are already manufactured. So we just have to source from our current supply chain and then just manufacture them in this configuration. Do you think you'll have to centralize that manufacturing um, and then have added cost of shipping those out? Like, how does that compare to the cost of the, the actual trucks? Uh, it's, it's uh, $40,000 per unit just to manufacture it from a commercial source and have it centralized, just like what you described. Whereas shipping a truck just across the European theater is 12,000 euros one direction. Got it, that's great. Can I ask you a question? I'm uh, obviously not an airplane guy, I'm a space guy, uh, but the way I'm putting this in my simple mind is it's an adapter. So when I go to, to Germany and I plug in my, thing into the German you know, wall, I have a certain socket. When I go to another country, it requires a different socket. You talked about this adapter uh, working at NATO standards. Uh, so we're gonna, uh, the Air Force is gonna deploy to non-NATO countries. Do you have to have multiple different adapter ed ends to plug into different things or is it NATO works across the world? Uh, sir, so it, it's um, an adapter for uh, policy more than anything. So when we conduct a hot pit, it's because of a safety requirement and the host nation or civilian airport wouldn't have that. So this allows us to be able to package the Viper kit at a much uh, drastically reduced cost and a much smaller footprint and allow us to use that instead of incurring the cost and everything involved with trying to coordinate a refueler to be shipped. So it's compatible with any NATO, any NATO standard, and then airports worldwide all use an industry standard um, receptacle for each nozzle. So as long as it's an otherwise approved clean, dry fuel source, we're ready to hot pit out of it. Got it. Hey, I appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, great idea. It's going to be really critical for the, for the department for sure. One minute warning, judges. Oh, Would you I actually jump in with a question just really briefly. Are there any other um, measurable impact that you can essentially that you're looking for or that you can measure at scale? Just trying to understand aside from cost, and I think there's some time element. Would like to see how you guys are thinking about that. So the uh, biggest measurable is the cost that it is relating to shipping assets, but it's adding an additional capability to us that we don't already have. So just to ship one R11 across the EU takes 72 hours to 10 days just to get the diplomatic clearances that we need to be able to ship it across country lines. The Viper kit doesn't require that because it doesn't apply, the hazmat certifications don't apply to it. So we can throw it in the bed of a truck and drive it to wherever we need it in, inside the EU or even if we wanted to adapt it into uh, the, PAC at the Pacific theater, it can tie directly into the adaptive basing concept. Judges, Jason, Tim, thank you so incredibly much. We're at the end of our five minute question and answer period. Great idea, guys and guys and gals. And this really brings us to the conclusion of our last team. Yeah, thank you, judges. We're now going to send you off to a private room to have your deliberations to select the Spark Tank 2021 winner. So if remember to join the breakout session now, uh, we'll take the audience through a couple of other videos and uh, while you do your deliberations. And remember, audience, you also get the chance to vote for your winning team. So polls will close in 60 seconds. So this is your last chance to impact the results. While we wait for the polls to close, we wanted to share with you a video of one of our finalists that you met earlier, Master Sergeant Justin Bauer, who, as you yeah. may have heard in there, had the ideas for the C-130 wheel repair and heard that he recently deployed and has spent time in the forward location in quarantine while we were coaching and going through the pitch uh, <laughs> training sessions. And uh, he was so excited to do that because it created a little bit of diversion, but he, and we were like, from what? He wanted to explain it. So here's a video that uh, Master Sergeant Bauer sent us about his quarantine crib. Hey, 
it's Matt Sergeant Bauer here to show you my quarantine crib and uh, show you how all the spark tank magic goes down in the AOR. All right, so here we got a massive bedroom. We'll take you over to the kitchen, keep all our snacks. Super equipped. Okay, let me take you to my office. All right, here we are in the office. All the spark tank magic happens. We've got a custom sit or stand desk. Just depends on how you use it. Now we've got it converted to the stand feature. I'll take you over to my master closet. Uh, that is a pretty, <laughs> it's a pretty sweet crib. It brings back all of the fun memories <laughs> all too soon. You know, as we get ready for the, to award the Spark Tank 2021 trophy, the trophy has traveled more around the world than any of us has, honestly. So here's the journey of the trophy that it took just to be able to get here. And how about that? We got a Cracker Jack production team that just worked some awesome video magic. That was a lot of fun putting that uh, video together. And uh, our thanks to uh, the entire production team and everyone else for helping us get that trophy safely back from Misawa Air Base, Japan. Absolutely. You know, it, it's been it's been amazing. It's been amazing the challenge of, of how we've been able to come together and not just put productions like this together, but make sure the innovation of the Air Force continues on, even though we may not be able to get together. That's exactly right. So, Trigger, while the judges are still out having their deliberations, I think it's important that we've, we, uh, we've got this late breaking news via text from the AFWorks Production Studios in Las Vegas. We have a winner of the audience poll. Let's Come hear it, please. <laughs> and the winner is the Viper Kit Hot Refueling Team. Awesome. The fan favorite trophy. Uh, so, uh, folks, we'll uh, make sure that we get uh, that plate on that, and then we're going to pass it, uh, send it out to you guys over at Spang Dollars. You can plow, proudly show your uh, your award-winning crowd crowdsourced uh, responses for our uh, our Spark Tank 2021 fan favorite. Congratulations, team! Over to you, uh, Timothy and Jason, if you want to accept the Academy or your elementary school librarian or whoever else. Yeah, uh, we actually, we just had one quick thing we wanted to say. Who the hell? Who the hell? <laughs> just that? You need to take up some more airtime. Our judges aren't back yet. <laughs> no, well, I we want to thank everybody that supported us <laughs> along the way. Um, from our community that's given us feedback to our, our leadership at our wing at every level. It's uh, It's been an awesome ride to get to where we're at. Yeah, we can't thank our flight leadership, squadron leadership, wing, everyone all the way up and down. My wife Shelly's here with us. I uh, thank everybody that's helped us along the way and given us the inspiration to keep going. I mean, this started off as a idea on a bar mat napkin just because I was like, hey, is this a good idea? And somebody was like, I think so. So, that, and then we just went with it. So, yeah, we're super excited. 
Excellent. Well, well done, you guys. And I want to throw a special shout out to uh, the leadership team in there at Spangdalem. Uh, people haven't noticed maybe, but Spangdalem had a co-winner last year with the Mercury Smart Weapons Loading Checklist. And now we've got a fan favorite for 2021 with the Viper Kit Hot Refueling uh, uh, idea. So thanks very much to your leadership at Spangdalem and to you Safi's leadership for putting together an amazing in innovation program that allows your airmen to take the reins and solve the how uh, problems that they run into on every given in any given day. You All know, right. Bruce, as, you, as you think about the challenges that that presents, a lot of people don't realize the hard work, sweat, tears and time that it takes to be able for these airmen to come up with their idea, to be able to make it happen, bring it to fruition and see the logical path forward to make this happen. So congratulations, team. You've done a great job. All right. Our judges, it must be a nail biting voting competition in there. I don't <laughs> see that our judges have come back yet. It really, it really must be, but I can totally understand because when you have so many impactful technologies and innovation that could truly change airmen's lives, all the way across the Air Force. I mean, this is something that the judges don't take lightly because this can really impact hundreds and thousands of lives. Exactly right. And the interesting thing for, for them this year, normally we have, uh, when we're on stage down in Orlando, we actually have a tiebreaker sitting in the front audience. So this year we had uh, the <laughs> Miss Darlene Costello, who is the acting Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition, Technology and Logistics, who joined our judges in the room, in the breakout room, so she could provide any tie-breaking vote. Because what we did on them this year is we gave them a Highlander rules uh, level of engagement. There can be only one. <laughs> Good thing. You know, as the judges come back and they're getting ready to be able to give their tally, uh, you would think that we would I would have we would use an iPad to tally it, but here they come. We're gonna tally the votes right here on a good old sheet of paper. And looks like they're back with the votes ready to cast them. All right, judges, we are so glad to have you back here. And I hope you have all your cards ready. I will call you one by one and have you individually show us which team you selected. Mr. Secretary, your spark goes to. Okay, here's my uh, my vote is, uh, can you see it? In the ear bone conduction In the headset. Ear. Yeah, I, I just, you know, I, first of all, let me congratulate all of the teams. Uh, what we talked about here when we went offline is just fabulous presentation. So my hat's off to everybody. Uh, I guess my perspective here is on sort of a national kind of a perspective here. They're dealing with a very fundamental problem that will scale across the force for both active and retired people and, and that type of thing. So that that tilted my vote toward the uh, the ear thing. So thank Excellent. you so much, Chief Brown. I, I voted for the C-130 will repair and, and like the secretary, all, all of them were good. I just couldn't imagine myself uh, pulling out a 200 pound, 250 degree hot uh, thing. I'm just imagine the, uh, the you know, uh, oven mitts you had as you were doing all this. This is so much simpler and it, it's ready to go. And so that's why I voted for the C-130 uh, wheel repair. Excellent. Chief Raymond. Who voted for the wheel repair? I renamed it as the satellite wheel, uh, wheel repair. And that's <laughs> Uh, I'm all in. Thanks. I, I, I thought it was really innovative, very simplistic. I thought you had a great uh, analysis, and I think it has an immediate impact on readiness. So, uh, again, to all, all presenters, uh, thanks for doing this. And uh, everyone was great. I appreciated the uh, opportunity to listen to all. Excellent. Thank you, Chief. Chief Bassler of the Air Force Bass. All right. I want to vote for all of them, but because I do not like to see any aircraft that are grounded, I had to go that route. C-130 wheel repair three, in the ear bone conduction one. There it is. Chief Master Sergeant of the Space Force Toberman. Uh, I'm going to be accused of bias since I was once the group uh, superintendent uh, above the 755th AMXS, but I am also on the C-130 and digital service. No piece of paper here. Oh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> look at that. <laughs> I'm behind. I'm behind. Excellent. Thank you for that. All right, Mr. Matt Booty. Uh, I thought all the presentations had just a, a fantastic uh, collection of everything from imagination to really thoughtful business presentation. Uh, so thank you for all the presentations. 
Um, I also voted for a C-130 wheel repair. I thought that just end to end from individual initiative to imagination through a well-presented business case, it was uh, a really well-presented project. Excellent. Ms. Brittany Davis. Hey, so I had to make shift. Um, but I hope you guys can see that. Oh, it's backwards. All right. I almost also That's going good. with the wheel repair. Um, I was kind of explaining to the group as an investor, I really can see the ROI um, from the project and just his ingenuity and kind of ability to get the product out. Uh, yeah, I had to go that route. Thank you very much. And Megan Metzger, we only have about eight seconds left for our feed. No pressure. All right. Uh, I'm also a C130 wheel repair. Uh, it was a really tough one. The business case was fantastic. The thought that went into how to test it already and get it out into the field quickly. And the, the long-term impact is pretty, pretty awesome there. But all of them, it, it was a close call. I want to invest in all of them. Excellent. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you to our chiefs of staff. Thank you to the chief master of the Air Force and to our celebrity judges for joining us in Spark Tank 2021. I hope you are renewed and recalibrated in your sense of amazement at how awesome our airmen and our guardians are. And we look forward to seeing you at Spark Tank 2022 next year. Until the feed gets cut, I would like to uh, turn it over to the C-130 wheel repair team, Master Sergeant Bauer, if you want to say a quick uh, second of thanks. Congratulations. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to the judges. Uh, I've had tremendous support from every level of leadership, including here in the AOR. Uh, my wife, my friends and coworkers have all, all stood by me since the beginning of this. I, I really appreciate it. And it's been a tremendous honor. I, I can't wait to share this with our airmen. Outstanding. Thanks very much. And good luck on the rest of your deployment. And we'll uh, we'll start working with your home team to make sure that the ideas move out. So I will say, too, that as the director of Spark Tank, it's my good fortune to run this program and that people the, recognize the winner gets bragging rights and the, use, uh, the display of that trophy for the next year. Uh, but uh, General Brown and, and General Raymond both reached out to me to say that uh, everybody gets support. And so we'll be following up with each of your teams. And I think Ms. Costello is nodding her, her head up and down there. We'll be uh, following up with each of your teams to uh, provide that support and be in touch. So we'll be fl fleshing out all those details over the next uh, several months. Thanks very much for attending Spark Tank 2021.